Good morning, Kensington. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? We're going to get started this morning. It's been a long time running down a dead end road, looking for that something that could fill my soul. Never found what I was searching for. It's been a long time running from a mess to pass But you can't go forward when you're looking back But I ain't looking back anymore He called my name, he called my name. And he stole my shame, stole my shame. Everything changed when I came running home fun what a what a big energy we had to start today so I know this is this has been a week hasn't it guys it's been, it's been a heavy week it's been uh, not not just with with the, the season we're in here as a church but also like just in general I feel like. so we picked this song a few weeks ago and it um it feels really fitting I, I know as a church our hearts are heavy but this song is a reminder that those pain and those hurts that we're feeling, we can lay those down at the cross because Jesus already did that for us. And I think as a church, this is a great time that we can really rally together around Joel and Joel's family because Joel's carried us through many times and it's time for, it's our turn as a church to carry him this time. So let's sing this together. Come now as you are, as you want to be. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come now. Tired, broken, scared, adjusting me. Ready or not, it's all right. Take your time if nothing else, just come.
Good morning. Do you believe that? Do you believe we ain't seen nothing yet? I believe it. I believe it. Hey, I just, uh, I'm Craig Lang, and uh, for those of you that don't know me, and I just want to make a couple of announcements today before we uh, continue uh, with some more music that's going to rock your world. Um, but first of all, I want to mention that next Friday, if we have the slide, we are moving towards Treat Street. Trunk or Treat, October 27th, 6.30, over at Travers Heights. And I talked to John Cargill this morning. We have, listen to me, six cars. We need, we need 40. So church, what I'm asking, we need your help. We need you to come forward and say, hey, I want to decorate my car. I want to be there to pass out candy to these children that live over in the Travers Heights area. It's an incredible opportunity to serve that group and that community over there. So please, there's two ways. You can sign up either online. There, there's uh, that little squiggly dot for you, <laughs> QR code. Or you can sign out out in the lobby. But please sign up. We need more vehicles, and we'd love to have you participate. Talking about 
candy and food. It's a natural just segue into our Mideats, which is going to be November the 1st here. Now, what I understand is that the turkey is going to be provided. I heard Joel is going to be in charge of deep frying all the turkeys. So that's cool. And all you have to do is bring your favorite Thanksgiving side dish. The turkeys will be furnished. I was here last month for the chili uh, cook-off. It's incredible. Just a great opportunity to connect with people that maybe you don't know, maybe you do, but you'd love the opportunity to come in here on November 1st, 630, and uh, be here for that incredible evening of, of, of community and sharing, sharing with each other. So, and giving thanks. Um, finally, uh, I want to mention to you that our service today is going to be a little abbreviated. Uh, it's going to go about, run about 50 minutes as long as I get off the stage here pretty quickly. And, uh, and after that 50 minute segment of our, of our service, uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute intermission. Uh, parents of children over in K-Kids, you can go get them. Uh, if, you, if you have something to go, you can leave, but we really want to invite everyone back. We're going to have some time just spent in prayer. Our senior pastor who is here today to give our message from downstate, uh, Brian Mowry, will be leading us in prayer. We're going to be praying for our church, praying for Joel, for the family, for our ministries. We'd love to have you participate. That will be 10 minutes after the conclusion of our service here this morning. Uh, finally, when you're coming in this morning, you should have got a card about No Child, which is an incredible ministry that, is, uh, that comes out of Kensington that brings and, and, and helps provide uh, support to the children in Kenya and in Nepal. So I would, I really want you to watch this video and then enjoy the music that comes with it. Thanks.
Oh, man. Oh, hey, I have to tell you, well, I've been, I, I have had the great blessing to go to Kenya on five different occasions and work in our children's homes there in Kodich and Kiryong. And I have had an opportunity to listen to the children of Kenya sing songs of joy because they've learned the gospel. They know the gospel. They know how much they're loved. And so this is why we really wanted to be here today to talk about No Child. Uh, if you could throw that picture up there. This, this picture, I think, says what you experience when you go to our children's homes over there. These children have really no adults in their lives. They, they, they basically, this is it. It's, it's one small child takes care of another small child. And there is very little human interaction and contact. It's, and yet you see their joy. And part of that joy, I've seen it in the times that I've been there, is based upon members of our church who have, through no child, basically sponsor them. And they know their sponsors. It's incredible. I have brought back letters from them to their sponsors in which they, they are so grateful for people that support them. And they, they, they love their sponsors. And, and I've, had, I've had them just pray, please tell my sponsor to come and visit me. I want to meet my sponsor. I, I want them to be here. And so, so you, you have these small children and when people like you and me come alongside and sponsor them, this is what happens. This is Elijah's high school book. He shared this with me in 2019 when I was there. And he's got his math. He's got, he, this is what our, without, without us, they have, this is not going to happen. They're not going to have the opportunity. And by us sharing our resources with them, we can make a huge difference there. And you should have picked up a brochure uh, or a card on the way in. I just want to urge you all to prayerfully consider becoming a sponsor through No Child. There's one little piece. If you can, Greg, can you? Yeah, this is on the bottom of his worksheet. I can do everything in God who strengthens me. That's the beauty of the gospel message for Kenyan children that really have the hope in their lives. Are you and me. So I want to urge you, sign up, become a sponsor for No Child. Thanks. We're going to invite our senior pastor, Brian Mowry, to the stage. Thank you. Stand up, say hi. <laughs> How you doing? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is good to be with you. And uh, it's great to be able to, to celebrate, to worship together, isn't it? I was thinking earlier this morning that the same God that was with us last week is the same God who meets us today. The same God who was with us 10 years ago. It's the same God who meets with us today. And so we are in the presence of the Lord today. And we come as a community asking the Lord to come and mend our hearts, come and speak to us, come and direct us, um, come and challenge us, to come and help us. And so I'm going to pray for that right now. Uh, for those of you who might be walking in for the very first time, maybe you're kind of going, what's going on in here today? I've heard some mention of different things. So I just want to share a little bit of what we're dealing with as a community right now. If you're here last week, uh, you heard Pastor Joel share that uh, he stepped down for a season uh, for his own personal healing, and uh, both he and I are in complete agreement with that, and uh, we're walking together in it, and uh, we're praying for Joel and his family in this time as a community, and uh, so now we're stepping into a moment where we're going to be walking together in a different way, and uh, so I wanted to come up quickly and be able to share with you a message that the Lord's placed on my heart and uh, something hopefully that will minister into this moment, into this season as a church. 
First, I want to say I'm so thankful that you returned. <laughs> I am, because I understand that there are decisions that you can make. After hearing something like this, you very easily could have said, you know what, I'm going to go find a different church. I'm going to go to a different place. Or you know what, I'm just not going to return. I'm not going to keep investing in my faith. Um, this is not a time to do that. I want to thank you for returning. Thank you for showing your support of this church, your love for this community, and uh, so thank you. I know maybe that was a decision for some of you, so thank you for coming today. I believe the Lord has great plans uh, for this campus, great plans for each one of us in it, and so thank you for being here. Let's pray, and then I want to jump into something. Lord, we're so thankful that your presence is the same today as it was yesterday and will be forever. And uh, Lord, we want to say that we're counting on you right now. We need you. Oh, Lord, we need you. How we need you. And Lord, we ask that you just come and speak to us in these moments, that you'd walk with us. The challenge at the beginning of this year was to go deeper in our relationship with you, Jesus, than we've ever gone before. And Lord, I still believe that's possible. Sometimes, actually, in, in times of great adversity, these are the times where we grow in you the most. So, Lord, I pray that each one of us would really lean in in this moment, that we would uh, meet you, that we'd come to know you in greater ways. I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I wanted to share a, a verse with you that's been on my heart for these last several days, and hopefully it's one that will minister to you, and maybe even one that you'd consider you know, writing down and putting somewhere that you see it every day. Because this might be something that will continue to, to be of help to you in this season. But I was just asking the Lord in my time of prayer, Lord, what, what would you have me reflect on, meditate on in this moment? And the Lord brought me to Matthew's gospel. I know we're in the gospel of Luke, but allow me to, to go off course here a little bit. But Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says this. And this is the words of Jesus. And so Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I love this passage. There's, there's such weight on every single word in this passage. I believe this passage is, is for you all today. In this passage, there's a petition, there's a person, there's people, there's a problem, and there's a promise. See what I just did there? All peas. That's, what just, that's just what good pastors do, right? That's just what happens when the good message. There's a petition, there's a person, there's people, there's a, pro, there's a problem, and there's a promise. It says, come. There's this petition, right? There's this invitation from Jesus. Praise God that we have a God that says, come to me. Come. You can come. You can come into the holy of holies. You can know me. You can understand my ways. You can receive blessings from me. Come. There's this petition. I want to encourage you in this moment, in this season, in the life of this church to come to Jesus. We could run to all kinds of different things, curiosity, speculation, gossip, all kinds of things we could run to. We could run to another place. Here's what I want you to do. No matter where you are, I, I want to encourage you to come to Jesus. Come, run to Jesus. There's this petition. Then there's this person, come to me. I love how Jesus says it so clearly. Come to me. Jesus is the answer in every situation. Jesus is. Come to Jesus. There's a petition. There's this person. But then there's people. Come to me, all you. I love that the scripture here doesn't say, come to me, all of you, except for those of you who have this or do this or have done that. No, this is beautiful. This is the beautiful message of the gospel that all of us, no matter who we are, can come to Jesus. No matter what we've done, where we've been, what we've said, the promises we've broken, we can all come to Jesus and he wants us to do that. Come to me, all you who are, and here's the problem, weary and burdened. Is anybody in this room weary or burdened with anything right now? Yeah. Sometimes just life does that to us, right? We're weary. We're, we're burdened. Sometimes we try to go about life all on our own. We try to carry the weight of the world upon our shoulders. We're weary. We're burdened. 
And I love the invitation from Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And then here's this promise. And I will. Whenever Jesus says I will, you can count on it. Bank on it. If I tell you I will, I hope you can trust me. But when Jesus says I will, you can bank on it. And he says, I will give you rest. I, I, I want you to know that's your promise today. That in Jesus, he wants to give you the gift of rest. That might not mean, you know, 12 hours of sleep every night. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus is talking about he wants to give you the gift of his peace, his compassion, his care. He wants to give you the gift of hope that there, you have a great future in him. And so I just wanted to just start with that passage and, and, and leave that with you. Maybe it's something uh, that you want to post on your, uh, your mirrors at home or in your car somewhere just to reflect on in this season. Continue to come to Jesus in this season. When you're weary, when you're burdened, come to him and ask him for his kind of rest. We're stepping into a brand new series today that I think is going to be very fitting over the next four weeks uh, for the Traverse City campus here. We're calling it Bring It, Bring It. The myth, I think, is this, is that you have to get everything right before you come to Jesus, right? Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I can't come to your church. If I walk into those doors, lightning's going to strike me dead. Have you ever heard that before? No? You're not asking enough people to come to church then, <laughs> okay? Because if you ask people to come to church, you're going to hear that or in some way, shape, or form. I can't step into, into church Right. The myth is that you can't come to Jesus until you've got everything right and fixed. But when I look at the life of Jesus, it speaks the exact opposite. The exact opposite is that Jesus, he, he tirelessly and, and, and continuously goes to people right where they are. Praise God that Jesus wants to minister to you right where you are. Bring it. <laughs> Bring it. Bring your doubts. Bring your curiosity. Bring your pain. Bring your hurts, bring your hang-ups, bring your habits, bring them to Jesus. He wants to meet you there. Let's shed that myth that you've got to be perfect in order to meet Jesus. Nah, in fact, if you think you're perfect, you have no need for Jesus. He wants you to come as you are. Bring it. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. I, I, I went back and forth on what, what I should share, and I felt the Lord led me to this. I want to talk about bringing your worry to Jesus. I'm sure this might be a moment where we're worried. This is a time of uncertainty for us here at the Traverse City campus. And I'm sure our minds are spinning. What's going to happen? Where are we going? How long are things going to take? Worry, worry, worry. What if this doesn't happen? What if it does happen? Da, 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 all this worry. I would imagine that this could be a very anxious moment and Jesus has a lot to say about our worry. And so today, I want to encourage us to bring our worry to Jesus. If you wouldn't mind, uh, if you're able, would you stand with me? And I want to read scripture to us today out of Luke's gospel. It's not going to come up on the screen, and that's intentional, because I want you to, just, uh, to open your ears and your heart to receive this word. These are words from Jesus to his disciples, Luke 12 verses 22 to 32. This is what it says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Praise God. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, to the hearing of his word. Amen. You may be seated. 
And as you are, our ushers are going to come and wait on us for this morning's offering as I continue to speak. And again, just want to thank you for your continued generosity to the life of the church. It's through your giving that we're able to do all kinds of things for our local community, for our youth, for our kids, and uh, also things around the world, much like you just saw with No Child. And so I'll just say a quick prayer. Lord, pray for this offering today. We thank you that we get the chance to bring you a gift. How cool is that? And so, Lord, we just make this offering to you in your name. Amen. Amen. So they'll wait on you now. In this passage, you notice Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he asks this question, why do you worry? I want to ask you, why do you worry? I would imagine if Jesus were to look at me and say, hey, Brian, why do you worry? I'd have a great answer for him. Wouldn't you? Well, Jesus, that's an easy answer for me to, uh, question for me to answer. I worry because I have four daughters. That's why I worry. I worry about boys coming into their lives that, that shouldn't be in their lives. I worry about that. People always tell me, you know, did you wish you had boys? And I said, you know what? No, I love that I have all girls. And guess what? The boys are coming. I just don't want them to come, right? I don't want that. I don't want that. I worry about that. I got four kids. You know, college prices are decreasing right now, which is great. No, right? They're going out of the, they're just like beyond control. Like how, how am I going to, I could sit up all night wondering, how am I going to make this possible? You know, I think about all these, yeah, Lord, I worry. I just stepped into a brand new senior pastor position, you know, of this little tiny church in Michigan. Like, yeah, there's a lot of things I could worry about, Jesus. It's a great question. Why do I worry? Let me tell you all the reasons why I worry. And you can look at all those things and go, wow, those are legitimate things. I'm actually getting a little bit hot up here right now as I talk about these things, right? There's a lot of reason for us to worry. You might have really good reason to worry today. And I love what Jesus does. He just, he just kind of looks at them and says, don't, don't worry. You know the worst thing you can say to somebody who's worrying? Hey, don't worry. <laughs> oh, Thanks for that spectacular advice. How many years of, you know, master's level counseling classes did you take in order to give that? Just don't worry. Now I just feel relieved from my worry because you said don't worry. It doesn't make sense, right? The worst thing you could say to somebody who's worrying is don't worry. You might remember, if you're old enough, this great song in the late 1980s called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Anybody remember that song? It's a great song. Even if you don't know it, you probably know the tune. It was by Bobby McFerrin. It was on the top of the charts for so many years. The song just makes you feel good. Like even as you think about the music, like it's a feel-good song. It's bouncy. It's happy. The whistling is awesome in it, right? I, I, I kind of want to try it. Can we try it? Let's try it, right? So right, it goes like this, right? Right, that's fun. You did pretty good there. You did pretty good there. I needed to wet my whistle there for that. But, but here's the thing. It's bouncy. It's happy. But actually, the song has zero substance. Do you know the lyrics to this song? Let me read them to you. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry. Be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. Ain't got no gal to make you smile. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> There's zero substance to this call to not worry. So my question is, is when Jesus says don't worry, is there any substance to it? Is there any substance at all? You know, I actually think that Jesus was the only one who could say to the disciples in this moment, don't worry. Do not worry. Don't worry. Now, remember, the disciples had a lot to worry about as well. They left their occupations, possibly their families behind, their money, their food, their clothing. They left it all to follow Jesus. They could have looked at Jesus and said, listen, no, we've got reason to worry, Jesus. Really good reason. We left everything to follow you. They could have worried about a lot of things. Did I make a huge mistake in following this Jesus? 
Is he the real deal or not? Will I have enough to eat? Will I have something to wear? Will I be able to face the opposition that's coming our way? They had a lot of reason to worry. And Jesus just looks at him and says, do not worry. Is there any substance in that call? If Jesus were to look at you, Traverse City Campus, in this moment and say, do not worry, would there be any substance at all? I remember I was watching a football game. It was a playoff game years back. This is when my team used to be awesome. They're no longer awesome at all. That's because I came to Detroit, and now Detroit is awesome, right? I just, I don't know if I, don't know if I had anything to do with it, but I like to feel like I had something to do with it. And, uh, and I remember watching this playoff game with my buddy. I had to watch it later than the actual game because we were doing something. So I was watching it with my friend. He had already seen the game. We were watching the recorded version. My team went down like 28 to 3, something like that. This is actually, no, this is actually the Super Bowl. You'll, you'll know who this is in a moment. It was 28 to 3. And I'm just like, oh, this isn't good. This doesn't feel good. But I kept looking over at my buddy, and he was fine. And he was a fan too. And he was just like kind of sitting there, kind of, you know, kind of holding back, you know, grins like this, right? I'm like, how is he okay when we're losing 28 to 3? Right? This doesn't make any sense. And then all of a sudden I watched as my team came back and one of the greatest comebacks of all time. And they win the game. And I looked over and I was like, finally I got it. Why, why he was so confident, while he was so assured. At one moment I even think he told me, hey, say, look, don't worry. How could he say don't worry in that moment? Because he knew something that I didn't. He knew something that I didn't know. Why was Jesus able to look at the disciples in this moment, and and they've given up everything, they're worrying about all kinds of things. Why was he able, why was he qualified to be able to say to them, do not worry? It's because he knew something they didn't. Right now, our God knows something we don't. He knows And he's got us. That if we walk with him, he's going to minister to us. He's going to bless us. He's going to comfort us. He's going to give us his peace. He's going to direct us and guide us. And this is why Jesus in this very moment together is the only one who can really say, don't worry, because he knows the things that we don't. And friends, don't we know some things that the world doesn't know? We know that we can have hope in Jesus. We know that he's the light of the world. We know that he can speak to us and minister to us. And so in this very moment, although we're hurting and there's pain and that's very real and we need to walk through that, we also can walk in this season with great hope, knowing the one that we walk with. Jesus, he knows the things that we don't. He goes before us. And so I just wanted to share four lessons with you in times of uncertainty. And this is a time of uncertainty for us. I want to share four lessons that come from this passage, and I hope that they'll help us and minister to us. The first is this. As I read this passage of Jesus, you know, turning to his disciples and saying, do not worry, I learned that our God cares about us deeply. That we have a God who cares about us deeply. In verse 24 of our passage, it says this. Jesus says, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Whenever I look at this, I'm like, why is Jesus talking about birds? And one thing you have to know about me is I don't like birds. It goes much deeper than that. Actually, I have like a phobia of birds. If you were to release a bird in this room or just say there's a bird in this room, I would leave. I would leave, and Craig would have to finish my sermon, I think. I have a phobia of birds. So why is Jesus talking about birds in this moment? Consider the ravens. And and why Jesus giving this answer would have actually amazed the people because they knew their Old Testament so well. And it would have drawn them to the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, where there's this list of, list of creatures that were considered clean and then others that were considered unclean. And so they would have known this law that was written in the Word of God. And these were the things that were on the menu and the things that were off the menu, the clean things and the unclean things. And in Levit- Leviticus chapter 11, God lists the unclean birds. These are the things that you weren't supposed to eat. Eagles, vultures, kites, owls, gulls, hawks, a spray, stork, heron, And then right in the middle, 
In verse 15, God lists any kind of raven. So when Jesus says, listen, consider the ravens, immediately people have been thinking, oh, the ravens, they're, they're on the don't eat bucket list. They're the unclean animals. Don't touch them. Don't, don't, don't have anything to do with them. And so when Jesus says, listen, consider the ravens, even the ravens God takes care of. They're on the ban list. Yet Jesus tells the people that day, God feeds them. God cares for them. And we are so much more valuable than the ravens. Isn't it obvious that God will care for you? If he cares for even the ravens. I love how the passage says, yet God, yet God, even though they're on the band list, even though they're unclean, God even cares for them. How much more will he care for you? Jesus' point is this. Don't spend your life worrying about these things. God will care for you. Yet God, yet God, you might feel forgotten. You might feel on the outskirts of life. You might feel unimportant. Yet God, yet God, he cares for you deeply. I want to encourage you in this season to ask the Lord to reveal his great love for you. Lord, show me, reveal to me, your great love for me. He cares deeply for you. Second thing, second lesson I learned from this passage in a season of uncertainty is this, is that our worrying gains us nothing. You want to know what worrying breeds? When you worry, all it breeds, all it produces is more worrying. Worry is like a snowball going down a hill. It just builds and builds and builds. And we gain nothing by worrying. Our passage in verse 25 says this. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? I love that question that Jesus asks. The answer is easy, right? None of us gain any time by worrying. In fact, we lose time. That's what we do. By worrying, which increases more worrying. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that if we worry, if worry and worrying is unable to even add a single hour to your day, how is worrying going to deliver on the more important things of life? If it can't even add a single hour to your day, how is worrying going to deliver on the bigger aspects of life? Worrying's not going to get us out of a situation. Worrying's not going to get our kids into college. (laughs) Worrying's not going to make the church thrive. Worrying's not going to keep me healthy. Worrying's not going to get me healthy. Worrying's not going to save my business. Worrying really gains us nothing. In fact, the opposite is true. When we worry, generally what it does is it leads us down unnecessary paths. Let's just say that you had a child, an infant, and that child was now becoming, you know, two years old. They're beginning to, their teeth were beginning to come in. And all of a sudden, their first first tooth comes in. That's not two, is it? That's more like one, six months. It's been a while, okay? My youngest is here. She's 11, so it's been a while. Give me grace, okay? Six months, okay? Let's just say six months in, that, that, that tooth starts coming in, and you're like, huh, you're looking at that tooth. Like, that tooth looks a little crooked. Oh, no. Oh, man, that, that, that tooth's crooked. What are we going to do about that? Um, she might need braces, but I don't, I, don't, I don't have extra money for braces. Now she's going to have to get a job so she can pay for her own braces. But what if she can't, oh man, what if she, what if she can't find a job? Now she's going to have all this time on her hands, and with all that time on her hands, she's probably going to get mixed up in the bad company. She's going to find herself under the bleachers of the, of the big stadium at the football games. And now she's, you know what? People are going to offer her drugs. I bet they're going to offer her drugs. And she's going to, she's going to take those drugs. And now she's, now she's going to get this addiction. And, and we don't have the money to send her to a, a good clinic for that. Now what's going to happen? Now what's going to happen? She's going to get even into more trouble. And she's going to get in trouble with the law. And, and we don't have the money to fund a good lawyer. So, She's going to go to jail. My daughter's going to go to jail. I, and, and all because she has a crooked tooth, right? But if you think about it, maybe what will happen is she becomes a songwriter and becomes like Jewel, like the greatest, you know, singer. You don't know that. You don't know that, right? It's like sometimes we go down, oftentimes, we go down 
unnecessary paths of things that never happen, never happen, just because of our worrying. Our worrying, it gains us nothing. A lot of times what our worry is, it's fabrication. It's fairy telling, fairy story, storytelling. And, and, and our, our worrying gains us nothing. I want to encourage you in this season to resist worrying. And instead, transfer your, your time of worrying to time in the Word and time praying and interceding for this church. Third lesson. The third lesson I learned from this passage is that our God is faithful. There's a quote. I don't know the source of it, but the quote goes like this. Why worry when you can trust? Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but doesn't get you anywhere. (laughs) I love that. In this passage, the flowers could labor and spin, but it would get them nowhere. They're made beautifully by the Lord. And if we can trust the Lord to clothe the wild flowers with such beauty, even though they only last a little while, shouldn't we trust Him to provide for us? What does God want to tell us about His faithfulness in this season? I was thinking about this. Here's what I believe the Lord might want to say to us in this season about His faithfulness. I believe if you seek him in this season, you will grow in your relationship with him more than you've ever grown before. I can see you all in this season. I can see people hearing from God better as you go and you listen to him. I can see people understanding the ways of God better in this season. I can see people's faith being stretched in this season. I can see people serving others way beyond their comfort zone in this season. I can see people stepping into deeper and stronger relationships with one another as they pursue the Lord together in this season. You know, as I was reflecting on this, friends, I don't believe that this is a time to lose for us as a church. This is a time for us to gain, to gain a better understanding of the faithfulness of God. Fourth lesson, and then I'll just close with a couple words. The fourth lesson I learned from this passage is that our heart must be set on the kingdom, on his kingdom. In verse 29, it says, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Don't set your heart on the things that are worrying you. Don't place your heart there. Instead, place your heart. Seek his kingdom, but seek his kingdom. Place your heart on on kingdom things. There's higher ground than the ground of of worry. I, I remember... When I was younger in high school, my brother would always take us on these trips to the Onorondack Mountains, which is in upstate New York. It's beautiful there. And um, I remember going on one of these trips with my brother, and, and we went and we were climbing the highest mountain in, Onorond- in the Onorondack Park, which is called Mount Marcy. And we got to the top, and I remember sitting there just looking around, just like taking it all in. I was like, wow, this is an amazing view. This is spectacular. Wow, we've arrived at the top. And then my brother said, hey, put your pack on. We got to keep going. And I looked up and I was like, oh, there's a whole nother level up there to get to. I was down here, but there's this whole other level. He says, no, no, no. Let me take you to the top. You think you're, you're here right now, but you're not in the right place. Let me take you to the top. And I think this is what Jesus is doing with his disciples in the moment. He's like, yeah, you, you've decided to follow me. You've committed your lives to me, but, but you're stuck on this point on the mountain. Come with me. There's higher ground for you to take. And friends, I, I want to encourage you and challenge you to take the higher ground in this moment. To, to try to ask the Lord to, to help you move past your moment of, of worry and place you into kingdom thinking. To set our hearts on seeking his kingdom seeking his ways. Practically, this is what I think this means for us right now. I think it means committing to spending one-on-one time with Jesus every day, bringing your worry to him, your hurt, your curiosity to him. Spend one-on-one time with Jesus. I think it means speaking to him and listening to him. Have conversation with Jesus. Talk to Jesus in this season. And I think it also means continuing to step out in faith in this season. Let this not be a season where we just stand still, but a season where we step out in faith together to see all that the Lord wants to do. Let me close by saying this. I was asking the Lord in my one-on-one time with him, 
what he would want me to say to you right now. And I said it once, but I'm just going to say it again. So I strongly believe that this is a time for the church to gain, not lose. Don't let worry rob you of going deeper in your relationship with Jesus. I think that this is a moment where we have an opportunity, actually, as a church, specifically as this campus at Traverse City, a time for us to gain the peace of the Lord in our life, a time to gain trust in the Lord. Lord, we trust you. This isn't my church. This isn't Joel's church. This is Jesus' church. This is the Lord's church. Always has been, always will be. And so this is a moment for us as a community together to say, Jesus, be the Lord of your church. We trust you completely, Jesus. I think this is also a time for us to gain understanding of and dependence in the presence of God. Lord, we need you. And I think it's also a time for us to gain as a community. This is a time for us to come together, to lean on one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. And so, friends, I do pray that we would look back at this season not as a, a, a moment of, in, of entirely losing things, but a moment where we said, you know what? We actually gained a lot in that season. The Lord met us and walked with us. Worry entered our mind, but we took the higher ground we met with Jesus one-on-one, -on -one and he ministered to us in a powerful, powerful way. The presence of God that's here today is the same God who's been with us all along. He's trustworthy. Let's walk with him in this season. I'm going to close and, and pray, and, and uh, here's what I want to invite you into. We don't have a closing song or anything like that today, uh, but what I'd love for you to do is um, we're going to have a time of prayer in about 10 minutes from now. And uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes in prayer. I'll just kind of give you the time frame so you know how quickly you can get to lunch and other things. But we wanted to just take a, a moment for all who are able to just come back into this room after 10 minutes. And we want to lead you in some times of prayer. And so some of the leadership here, myself included, we're just going to lead in prayer, allow you the chance to pray in silence, to pray out loud. Uh, but this is just one opportunity. There are more coming. This Tuesday night, I believe, there's a chance to come back uh, I think that's at, is that six, at 7 o'clock, which is all, where all good things in the life of the church happen, at 7 o'clock in the evening. Come back Tuesday night. It's a great opportunity just to come, again, for some led times of prayer, times to, to heal together, times to lift up the campus, to lift up Joel, uh, to just have that time together Tuesday night at 7. If you're unable to make it today or if you want to do both, fantastic. So 10 minutes from now, you can bring your children back in. We're going to have some coloring sheets, some other things for them. Uh, and we'll have about 30 minutes of prayer if you're able to join us. But let me, let me pray for us. Would you stand with us? Because I just kind of give a benediction of sorts. It's a very traditional word, right? Benediction. But here we go. Friends, you are the church. And I pray that you would go in the power of the Spirit. That you would become more the church than you've ever been before. As you stand together as you walk together, and as you walk with Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just bless this congregation. Lord, I pray that you would um, do more than what we could ever think or imagine in this season. I pray that people would come to faith in this season. I pray that people would be baptized. I pray that people would grow in their relationship with you like never before. And so, Lord, I pray that this would be a season where we gain in our relationship with you. I pray all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I will be present, too, if anybody wants to come and speak to me. But in about 10 minutes, um, we'll gather back in this room for a time of prayer, if you're able. Thanks so much.